another of the uh, IPv6, IPv6 gurus in the world. Uh, well, he was here, uh, and uh, well, you cannot, uh, Owen cannot be here, and I cannot ask him to, to present something. So he's going to present a, a IPv6 for, for Linux. Uh, so, well, uh, welcome all, uh, to Owen. He works uh, uh, as well as Martin in Hurricane Electric, and he's been working in IPv6 for for long time, and, uh, and it's, it's great to have uh, him here, and, uh, and uh, well, welcome. Hello, everybody. I want to thank uh, LACNIC for uh, allowing me to be here, and also uh, United Airlines, though uh, not in the way you would think. They uh, basically delayed my flight yesterday to the point where I ended up staying the night here unexpectedly, so that's why I'm able to be here with you today. So IPv4 NAT. Um, the best description uh, I heard of carrier grade NAT was actually from somebody here uh, a little while ago. He said carrier grade NAT amounts to cutting a sandwich into 8,192 pieces and pretending you have 8,192 sandwiches. So you need to make a decision as to which approach you're going to take, whether you're going to uh, go with IPv4, IPv6 dual stack uh, relatively soon and enjoy a, a smooth running network that you don't have to worry about for many years to come, or whether you're gonna follow the, uh, the guy on the right and uh, decide that NAT is working just fine. So I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about the basics of IP version six how IPv6 addresses are, are actually assigned to interfaces, configuring IPv6 native on Linux, uh, how to do IPv6 where you can't get native, and how to get IPv6 for free in some cases. We'll also touch a little bit on routing, firewalls, DNS, reverse DNS, and staff training. IPv4 and IPv6 are not all that different at the basic protocol level, but IPv4 has a key problem that has sort of driven the way we interact with it in some very perverse ways. The scarcity of IPv4 has led to such bizarre implementations as NAT, network address translation, um, really restrictive RIR policies. It, it's hard to get um, enough v4 to do any long-term planning uh, and all of that. So. We really need to think differently about IPv6, not because it's so radically different from IPv4, but because we're so used to all of these constraints of scarcity that we're not ready to deal with a protocol that doesn't have scarcity in a lot of cases. In IPv4, we had 32 bits. In IPv6, we have 128. That gave us 3.2 billion unicast addresses for IPv4. It gives us 42 plus undecillion IPv6 unicast addresses in the current space being allocated as, as IPv6 unicast. That's only 2000 slash three, which is one eighth of the total IPv6 address space. In IPv4, we were very used to working with slash 24s, 254 host, uh, commonly known as a class C network, though classes were deprecated many years ago. In IPv6, the most prevalent network size, and in fact, every network, unless you've got a really good reason to do otherwise, should be a slash 64. <laughs> How many slash 64 is the longer form answer is a little more than eight billion. In IPv6 dotted decimal notation, like 192.0.2.239, in IPv6 is hexadecimal quads, which is four hex digits per group, and there are eight groups of four hex digits. In IPv4, we shortened by sing leading zeros with uh, octet. In IPv6, we su suppress the leading zeros in each quad. We can suppress consecutive zeros, uh, consecutive all zero quads with a single double colon. You can only suppress one group of all zero quads though per address. I like to try and help people visualize really large numbers because in my experience, people can visualize pretty directly one, two, three, five, ten, 10, even up to maybe 100. But after 100, it starts to be big number, bigger number, bigger, bigger number, and bigger, bigger, bigger number. And the numbers don't really scale, just sort of gets lost. So to 
help you visualize the scale of IP and IP6, a large PAMS holds about 254 almond M&Ms. Yes, I did actually count a few of them. <laughs> so, hey, it's research, right? Um, so that's kind of like a class C network if you think of each M&M &M being a host. Well, if you were to look at a slash 64 in IPv6, you actually get enough M&Ms, enough hosts, to fill the entire Great Lakes, all five lakes, from, the, from their bottom all the way up to their average tide level, completely full of M&Ms. That is a lot of M&Ms, because those lakes are big. Conversely, if you want to treat each slash 24 as an M&M, that would give you enough M&Ms to spread a single layer of M&Ms, only one M&M deep, across 70 yards of an American football field. Not a soccer pitch or, or you know, what you guys think of as a football field, but an American-style football field. Only the first 70 yards. It wouldn't even cover the whole field. That's all of the IPv4 address space. On the other hand, if you look at the number of slash 64s available in all of IPv6, you again get enough M&Ms to fill the Great Lakes. And remember that each of those M&Ms now represents the Great Lakes full of M&Ms worth of hosts. So imagine filling the Great Lakes worth of M&Ms and then having each of those represent the Great Lakes, the, the Great Lakes full of M&Ms squared versus 70 yards of a football field. It's that radical of a difference. This means we need to change our thinking. In IPv4, we thought about assigning addresses to hosts, right? If we wanted to, to, to build a new subnet, we went, well, I need six hosts so I can give it a 29. Oh, I need seven hosts, I have to give it a 28, but God, I really hate to waste those extra six addresses. And we thought about it in those terms. In IPv6, just give the network a 64. If it's two hosts, if it's 200 hosts, if it's 2,000 hosts, give it a 64 and be done with it, okay? A lot of people come to me when I say this and, and ask me, isn't that really, really wasteful? You know, putting, shouldn't we use something smaller for point-to-point -point links given that they're only ever gonna have two hosts? And my answer to them is, is it okay to use an IP, a, a slash 64 if you're gonna have 1,000 hosts or 200 hosts? And of course they always say, yeah, that's fine. And I, I point out to them that even if you, if you use 200 addresses on an IPv6 slash 64, you still have 18 quintillion addresses and then some that you're wasting. So the difference between two hosts and 200 hosts and 2,000 hosts in a slash 64 is still in the noise. It's in the rounding error above 18 quintillion on the size of the network. Optimization in IPv4 was about trade-offs between aggregation and scarcity. The reason we have 350,000 routes in the IPv4 routing table is not because of traffic engineering. It's not even entirely because people in certain parts of the world haven't figured out what aggregation is. It is almost entirely because of mechanisms like slow start and giving out small bits of address space and slowly growing networks and giving them more and more allocations over time, okay? That is how we ended up with 350,000 routes in the routing table. That's how we ended up with 10 routes per autonomous system. In IPv6, we have the option of not doing that. We can give very large assignments up front um, and, and providers shouldn't have to come back for, for more than one or two assignments in their entire uh, existence. So again, in IPv4, we used a sequential slow start uh, methodology with a lot of fragmentation. In IPv6, we can use bisection to minimize fragmentation. We can issue large blocks minimal requests for more, and aggregation uh, is, is preserved even across some expansion. Network address translation is strictly a, an IPv4 stopgap. I call it IPv4 life support. Um, IPv4 has been essentially dead and on life support since the early 1980s, okay? It's been that long that we've been keeping this protocol alive 
and struggling with this network address translation life support mechanism. We do not need NAT in IPv6. How many people here think NAT has something to do with security? Oh good, the word is finally getting out. <laughs> okay, NAT is not a security tool. In fact, it is actually harmful to security. In terms of address configuration methods, we have static and DHCP in IPv4. We have those same methods in IPv6, but we also have another method called stateless auto configuration. So another new concept for IPv6 is known as address scoping. We have two scopes. There's link local and there's global unicast. Global unicast is the same thing you're used to in IPv4. It's addresses that are valid anywhere on the internet. Link local addresses are strictly valid within a link. And a link is what most of you are used to thinking of as a subnet, but it's the hardware concept of a subnet, not the software concept. So you can actually have multiple IPv6 subnets on the same link, but all of the hosts that, uh, that, that can be reached by a given host without traversing a router are considered to be on the same link, okay? Link local addresses are only valid within the context of the particular link, so they can never cross a router. There's another sort of pseudoscope known as unique local addresses. These are essentially the IPv6 equivalent of RFC 1918 addresses, or quote, private addresses, unquote. And they're really not necessary in IPv6. They don't really serve a, a purpose but some people with a lot of IPv4 think thought they really needed them, so they managed to get it through the IETF. And then, of course, we have global, which is, uh, again, what you're used to working with in IPv4. So stateless autoconf is the easiest way to configure a host for IPv6. You don't need to do anything. All you need to do is plug it into an IPv6-enabled network with an IPv6-enabled router, turn it on, it'll power up and get an address automatically. It does have a couple of shortcomings. It provides only prefix and router informa information. There's a limited ability to provide information about DNS. There is no ability to provide anything about NTP servers, boot files, boot servers, or anything like that. If you need any of those additional services, you need to use DHCP, either in conjunction with stateless address auto configuration, known as stateless DHCP, or to also issue the address known as stateful DHCP. It also assumes that all advertising routers are essentially created equal. It has no ability to discern an invalid router from a valid router. We also have this problem with rogue DHCP servers in V4, so it's not a new issue per se, but it does change the nature of the issue somewhat. Stateless auto configuration process works this way. The host wakes up and it knows its MAC address. If the MAC address is a 48-bit address, it will convert that to an EUI64 address, which is essentially a 64-bit form of the MAC address by separating the organizational unit identifier, the first 24 bits, from the end unit identifier, the, the last 24 bits, and putting FFFE in the middle. Because that now makes it no longer a global MAC address, but a locally generated MAC address, the two bit is set in the first octet. The next step is it will do a duplicate address detection. It will ask the link if there are any other hosts using that address. If a duplicate is detected, the host will shut down IPv6 on the interface so as not to cause harm to operating network uh, components and operator intervention will be required. Assuming it does not detect a duplicate, it will send out an ICMP6 router solicitation to the all routers multicast group. Note this is not a broadcast packet. There are no broadcasts in IPv6. All of the broadcast-like functionality is implemented using multicast, which allows the scope of those packets to be limited to the hosts that care about them. Routers send an ICMP6 router advertisement back, either unicast to the link local address of the host in question, or they send it to the all host multicast group. These router advertisements are also sent periodically to the all host multicast group anyway, just to, to refresh timers on hosts that already have their addresses. The router advertisement includes a lot of potential information. It can include a preference, 
It can include a list of prefixes, a desired lifetime, and a valid lifetime for each prefix. It can, it can include route information objects, which are essentially static routing configuration hints for the host. Uh, unfortunately, not all hosts process those correctly. Um, the reason we have two timers is to allow for uh, better management of renumbering processes. The desired lifetime will cause the address to be valid for new flows to be created. So when a host is initiating a flow, it will use a source address that still has time left on its desired lifetime. Once the desired lifetime expires, the host will no longer use that address to initiate new sessions. But the address does remain configured on the interface. When the valid lifetime expires, then the address is deprecated and removed from the interface. The prefixes plus the EUI64 address that we came up with when determining our link local address earlier are what are used to create global unicast addresses. If you want to use DHCP, you can assign prefixes other than slash 64. Stateless AutoComp only works with a slash 64. Usually if you're assigning prefixes other than a slash 64 with DHCP, you should be using DHCP prefix delegation to assign shorter prefixes such as a slash 48 to customer premise equipment, for example. It can assign addresses to hosts, but it cannot provide any default or other routing information. It can provide additional information about DNS, boot files, NTP, boot servers, etc. Some vendors have limited DHCP support, so make sure that you get what you need from your vendor. Finally, we have static addressing. IPv6 can be assigned statically just like IPv4. Uh, it is common to use one of two techniques, either converting the, the IPv4 address to hex or converting uh, just using binary coded decimal representations of the IPv4 address. As long as you keep the first three uh, hex digits of the suffix zero, it will not conflict with autoconf or DHCP addresses. Privacy addresses are essentially a special form of stateless auto configuration, which uses a new suffix periodically or possibly even for each flow, and this is used to obfuscate the MAC address so that it can't be used to track a host as it moves along to different networks. They're documented in RFC 3041. Basically, it takes the MAC address and some random numbers and thro throws that all through an MD5 hash to generate a new 64-bit number. Uh, the preferred and valid lifetimes are derived from the stateless autoconf prefix information. Multiple addresses per interface. Some implementations of IPv4 had some varying support for this. In IPv6, it's absolutely required in all implementations. There's no concept of a secondary address in IPv6. All addresses on an interface are essentially created equal. In IPv6, the single address on an interface will actually be unusual because you'll usually have at least a link local and at least a global unicast in order to actually be able to do anything useful. Another difference is IPsec. IPsec was actually originally developed for IPv6 and then later backported to IPv4. In IPv4, IPsec is, is a, a very crufty add-on and it's implemented in a very hackish way. In IPv6, it is a required part of any IPv6 implementation. You're not required to use it, but it's supposed to be there in the protocol stack. It is considerably easier to configure IPv6 IPsec in IPv6 than it was in IPv4, and the compatibility levels are much better. Automation may be possible in future IPsec implementations using opportunistic encryption. Configuring IPv6 natively on Linux depends on your distribution. Debian-based distros such as Debian, Ubuntu, etc. use Etsy interfaces or Etsy network interfaces. Red Hat-based distros such as Red Hat Enterprise Linux, Fedora, and CentOS use Etsy sysconfig slash network dash scripts slash ifcfg dash and then the interface name. This is an example of an Etsy network interfaces file. Uh, the first group the first configuration block is an IPv4 static configuration. The next block is an IPv6 static configuration. 
you can see they're very, very similar to each other. The final block is an IPv6 autoconf or stateless autoconf configuration. As you can see, it's very, very simple. Interface, interface name, INET6, auto. That's all you need. The same thing for Fedora. This is an ifconfig-eth0 interface file. Um, the first block, again, IPv4. The second block is uh, the additional config necessary for IPv6. And the last block is an IPv6 autoconf. You can have IPv6 without a native connection. So if your internet service provider is not yet ready for IPv6, you can work around them. There are three options. Your first choice should be to use a 6-in-4 tunnel using uh, either 6-in-4 or GRE. Your next choice should be 6 4 using an IPv6 auto tunnel. And your last resort should be Teredo. Why is 6 and 4 preferred? Well, first of all, most network administrators understand GRE reasonably well already. It's a very, very straightforward encapsulation process. There's no magic. It's simple. It's deterministic. It's easy to debug. It's controlled by two endpoint administrators or possibly even one, which makes it very, very easy to debug and, and, and get it working. You do have to configure it manually, but it's very, very easy to configure. The advantages of 6 to 4 when you can't make 6 in 4 work are that the configuration is automatic. When it works, it's pretty clean and relatively self-optimizing. It might be a good option for mobile devices like laptops, cell phones, etc. When it breaks, it's very hard to troubleshoot because it's not deterministic. And this is because of the anycast process that's used with it. Teredo has all of the advantages of 6 to 4 in, in terms of auto configuration and all of the problems in terms of any cast, but it does have the ability to bypass more firewalls, whether you want it to or not, by the way. Um, it is enabled by default in Windows, whether you want it or not. Uh, if you want to implement it on Linux, there's a client and server process known as Moreto available. You can download that easily. And it's even more complicated and tricky to debug when problems occur than 6 to 4. Are there any questions on what I've said so far? Feel free to interrupt me with questions if you have them. Configuring 6 and 4 tunnel on Linux, not quite as straightforward as one might hope, but there is help available at tunnelbroker.net. Uh, this is an example for the Route 2 Linux kernels, which are most 2.6 and later kernels. I think we're up to 3.22 now or something like that. Um, so it's just a few command line uh, fragments that you need in order to make it work. Um, it is actually now supported in more recent Debian configuration files. I haven't updated the slides yet to reflect that. Um, net tools for the older 2.4 and earlier kernels. Um, you can use uh, these few config lines and get it going. Um, none of the net two kernels uh, support, sorry, none of the net tools kernels support configuration of the tunnels in configuration files. Fedora 12 and later, you can configure it in config files. Unfortunately, it takes several config files to do it. You've got these two config files to start, and then you've got additions to these config files as well. IPv6 for free, yes, you can get IPv6 for free. There are a number of tunnel brokers out there that offer free IPv6. My personal favorite is the Hurricane Electric Tunnel Broker at tunnelbroker.net. Uh, also, if you or your organization has a presence at an exchange point with Hurricane Electric, we currently offer free IPv6 transit over the exchange. Uh, so just send us a peering request and let us know you'd also like transit and we'll get you going. Uh, in terms of routing, you've got all the usual suspects. Uh, OSPF is pretty similar to OSPF for IPv4, but you need to use OSPF version 3. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, BGP, you use BGP4 still, but it's multifamily BGP. And you'll use address family INET6 or address family IPv6, depending on which router vendor you're working with. Uh, router advertisements are implemented in Linux using a, uh, an unfortunately named RADVD daemon. Uh, and there's also support in Quagga and others. In terms of firewalls, IP6 tables is virtually identical to IP tables. 
So this is an excerpt from my IP6 tables config file at home. And you can see that other than the uh, IPv6 addresses in the, uh, in the specification, all of the other uh, parameters are identical to IP tables. DNS, very, very straightforward. Um, IPv6 addresses are represented by quad A records. So it's exactly the same as your traditional A record, except it's quad A and then an IPv6 address instead of A and then an IPv4 address. Reverse DNS is slightly more complicated. Um, the suffix becomes IP6.ARPA instead of inadder.ARPA. Um, you have to put all of the zeros back in. You can't use the shorthand notation. Um, each digit in the IPv6 address becomes a zone de demarcation point. And so you reverse that, put dots in between all of the numbers, take out all the colons, tack dot IP6 dot ARPA on at the end. The current bind versions ship with IPv6 template zones for all of the hints in RFC 1912, et cetera. IPv6 addresses are valid in ACLs just like IPv4. All of the same rules apply. Zone configuration is identical except reverse zones for IPv6 ranges are again called IP6.ARPA. So this is, for example, the reverse zone for my slash 48 at home. One thing you'll notice about IPv6 reverse zone files is they tend to have very, very small fonts. Um, the numbers are large. That's kind of inevitable with IPv6. Dollar origin can help a lot with that. So um, as you can see in the example here, um, this is a forward reference for mail host um, with an address of 192.159.10.2 and then a quad A record for V6 of 2620 colon 0 colon 930 colon colon 200 colon 2. Reverse zone pointers um, similar to above. Notice the use of dollar origin makes the rest of the reverse zone much, much shorter and a lot less typing and a lot easier to read. Common reverse DNS mistakes, not enough zeros. If you don't put all the zeros back, you get weird results and they don't work. Um, missing dots, it's very easy to, to do this. Um, I actually made this mistake when entering one of my hosts in to reverse DNS at one point when I was trying to do this by hand. Uh, and it took me about 30 minutes of staring at this to realize that the reason it wasn't resolving correctly was the missing dot there in the middle. Um, if you reverse first and, and then expand, you're likely to put the zeros back in the wrong place. I've done that a couple of times. Uh, troubleshooting is mostly like troubleshooting IPv4. Uh, mostly the same kinds of things go wrong. Start at layer one and work up the stack until it all works. If you're using IPv4 and IPv6 together, it might be easier due to familiarity to troubleshoot layers one and two using your IPv4 tools. Generally speaking, once layers one and two work for v4, they'll probably work for v6 in most cases. Um, a little bit about neighbor discovery. Uh, there is no ARP and no broadcast in IPv6, so neighbor discovery is done differently. Uh, this is one of the key differences you need to know about. Instead of using a broadcast address, the solicited node multicast address is uh, used, and that is actually specific to the, the suffix of the host you're trying to find. Um, in IPv6, in IPv4, we use the command ARP and then the IP address to find out the, the MAC address. In IPv6, you can use IP minus F, INET6, neighbor, show, and then the IPv6 address. Uh, if you're on a BSDoid system, uh, I think the uh, um, command is NDP uh, to, to get the same result. Uh, on many systems, ping is renamed to ping 6 in order to do IPv6 and traceroute is similar to really renamed to traceroute 6. However, on all systems, telnet, SSH, wget, et cetera, work as expected with either v4 or v6. I'm not gonna go into details, but there is a, a nice little trick with SSH that if you've got a v4 host here and a v6 host there, and you've got a, a dual stack SSH server in the middle, you can actually use an SSH tunnel through that host to do the protocol translation between the two hosts. So that can come in handy. 
and the details of how to do that are in the slides. I will provide the slides to LACNIC so they can post them on the website. Uh, in terms of staff training, hopefully this presentation helps a little bit. You're going to need a lot more. Uh, plan for it, please budget for it, allocate time for it, uh, and if possible, try to avoid having your staff distracted by their day jobs while they're in training. With that, I will say thank you very much and open it up to any questions. Questions? Bueller? Bueller? Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>